Hey guys, ECRG here, back with another video. Today we've got a very, very special guest here. We've got an interview with one of my longtime friends in the industry. She goes by the name of Tiffany. She's a clinical research associate, and she's been doing this for a couple of years now, but I'll let her tell you a little bit more about herself. Hey, Tiffany, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well. Um, could you go ahead and just share a little bit about yourself, maybe a little bit of, about your background in clinical research, you know, how long you've been doing clinical research and what kind of got you into it? Yeah, so I've been doing clinical research for about, uh, I would say, a little over four years. Um, so I started right out of college um, with an internship, which led me to become a CTA. Um, at Quint House, and then from a CTA, I moved on into the CRA position, and since then, I have been a CRA. Okay, um, so a lot of people are interested in kind of getting their foot in the door in clinical research. You found a great way to do that through an internship. How did that come about? Um, it was actually a, one of the, you know, like the career counselors at, um, co at colleges that they have. Mm -hmm. So she um, was helping me trying to find a job after graduation. And she um, came across this position and they were actually coming to NC State um, for a job fair. Um, once they came to the job fair, she was just like, you know, I think this will be a great position for you. I know you've been looking for everything. So I applied for the position. I got the internship. Um, once I was in the internship, um, we just um, pretty much did everything to learn about um, the role of the CTA and work with CTAs throughout. Um, after my internship was over, we had the chance to interview for the job um, to become a CTA um, at Quintiles, and I was able to get that position. Okay, that's awesome. So how long did you say the, inter the uh, internship was? The internship was for three months, so it was just a summer one. Okay. And did you have any experience in clinical research or bench research or anything before that, or that was your first really acclimation to anything research-oriented? I did not have any experience with clinical research. I had experience with like public health research. Um, I had did a little bit uh, internship, couple internships with public health research, but none with clinical research at the time. So this was my very first experience. But I did have the science background from um, my studies while in college. Okay, and you majored in human biology, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I majored in biological sciences and then um, nutrition. So, OK, you did the nutrition concentration. Mm -hmm. All right. So a lot to unpack there. Do you feel like your prior experience kind of helped you get that internship? You're like your prior like public health internships or prior like, you know, just needing a bio degree kind of helped you get that initial industry start? Um, I do feel like it did help. Um, I do think that with having that science background, it definitely helped because um, when they put these positions up, they do look for people with science backgrounds a lot of the time. Um, maybe in the past they weren't so they weren't so specific, sorry, um, about having the science background. But now when you look at the post more and more nowadays, they wanted some type of science related field as your background. Right. So I think that when I applied around that time, they were kind of, you know, moving towards that. So I think it definitely helped that I had that experience. And then I think that it helped that I already had, even though it wasn't clinical research experience, I did have some type of research experience with the um, public health department that I work with. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, just for some context, because uh, you did reveal some dates there, it's 2018 now. So if anyone's listening to this in the future, it is 2018 now. And you initially got the internship in what year? In 2014. Okay, 2014. So industry was a lot different back then. Um, changed a lot over the few years. But so you did that three-month internship. And then did they immediately offer you a job after that? Like, were you a senior in college when this was happening? Uh, um, take no. Take us through I, that. They, I had actually graduated um, from school. And so I was in the process of looking for a permanent position and I came across the internship. So, um, this was after I had graduated. 
um, and I was in the internship, uh, it wasn't a, a promise that we would get hired because it was other interns hired at the same time. But, right. um, you know, you would have to, you know, your performance has to be well, your manager has to recommend you, you know, things like that. And I ended up getting hired on full time. Okay. Now, were there other interns that were with you or was it just like you the only intern? No, there were other interns with me. Okay. All right. So for someone else who is looking to kind of get their foot in the door, would you recommend that same internship or have you heard about other internships that are better? Um, or? I have not heard about other internships cause be, because this was the first time I had even heard about uh, you know, just this industry in general when the um, career counselor brought it to my attention. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't really looking in this um, industry for jobs, period. So it was the first time that I had heard about it. Um, as far as me hearing about other internships, I don't really hear about other internships. I have heard about like different training programs that the um, companies may have for right. like the CRA role, but not necessarily internships. Right. I'm sure they do have them, but I just, um, you know, I just wasn't looking for them. So I, I can't say if they do or not. Right. Um, yeah. Internships are very, very hard to come by in this field. And I know different companies have them because I know the company that I'm employed by has them also, but they're very, very hard to come by. Um, I think they may have some partnerships with some schools for people to like kind of slide in there that way. But other mm -hmm. than that, I, I don't think they post them on the website with like a big like apply here link or anything like that. It's kind yeah. of it's kind of secretive. Exactly. Especially when you want to get into like the CRA department like that department of the company because i've seen multiple and i've had multiple friends go from college and do like the finance internships at the same company like they have a lot of those postings right but as far as like the clinical department postings it's not a lot right um yeah i don't know i don't know why that is because obviously interns can do a lot of good work in the clinical department and there's obviously a big need for people in the clinical department or just in clinical research in general. So, yeah, no, definitely. There's definitely a high need for clinical research associates in all, all areas. <laughs> yeah. Not just CRAs, everything, everything is needed. Um, I've worked on plenty of studies where, you know, pro some Very project true. managers are needed. They need project managers. Very true. They need project managers, assistants, they need other stuff. So, very true, because mo a lot of them are stretched thin as well. <laughs> right. So we'll see what they can do with that. Um, so you were intern for three months and mm -hmm. then you moved into the CTA role. How long were you a CTA for? Um, I don't remember CTA. I want to say it wasn't a long time because at the time, um, they were starting a new CRA program development program that they wanted to try out. Okay. So I applied for that program. And once I got into that program, I moved on to become a CRA. Okay. Um, so you would say probably less than a year in that yeah. role, but probably, mm -hmm. a, probably around a year total. If you count the internship experience, would you say exactly. that? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that that's perfect timing because I remember we talked around maybe 2016 or so and you were telling me about that, you know, being able to slide up in the program pretty quickly after you completed the CTA role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was a just a new kind of program that they were just trying to work out and figure out if they wanted to, you know, train future CRAs um, like this. And I just so happened to be accepted into the class. Um, at the time point that I was accepted. And so it kind of just went on from there. Right. That's awesome. So congratulations on that. Yeah, how long was you. how long was the program for? And what exactly did they talk about? Like teach you in there? Um, the program I want to say it was a few months, maybe three to five months. I don't remember exactly, but it was, it was a few months. It was, it was a good amount of time. Okay. 
And yeah, so I would say probably like three to five months was how long the program is or was. And so in the program, we they basically went over everything CRA related. Um, they went over, you know, source documents, what you see on site, dealing with different types of sites and different personalities when you go on site. Um, they they went talked over... about dealing with different personalities? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, it wasn't like it wasn't like a you know week long thing, but we did have like um, like just like a little um, what do you call those like just a little like, discussion uh, yeah yeah like just a little discuss like discussion about it like you know we had other CRAs um, come in and talk to us and just tell us about their experiences on site their experiences with um, different sites like their good sites versus their not so good sites or their strong personalities versus uh personalities that are like easy to get along with you know and it kind of just you know things that you already know because you know people have different personalities in the real world but when you have to put it into a this is my job um perspective you right. know it, it helped right so um we did a little bit um you know it was just like a like just a quick workshop on that. It wasn't anything long, but um, we talked about, you know, just the regulations involved with um, the FDA and then GCP. Um, we did, we talked about monitoring and we talked about um, at that time, the company that I was at, we talked about their reports, you know, how they like for their reports to be written and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so it just pretty much covered everything, so everything. It sounds like it was pretty thorough. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And then we also, uh, sorry to cut you off, but we also okay. did um, like observation. They also had observation visits built into it. Okay. So, all right. So what did you think was most helpful from that, from the training program as far as actually going on site? Apart from going on site? Well, let me re let me rephrase that. What did you, what did you think was most helpful from that training program um, for when you actually were doing the job? I thought the most helpful was actually the observation visits and also um, just going over the different types of um, just materials. Like they showed us um, things like what you should look for when you look for um, when you're looking at source documents, um, how it should look, how um, the ICF should look and just different things like that. So I felt like the most valuable thing for me was going out on an observation visit. But I also feel like um, those classes, like it prepped me for what to look for. And then those observation visits you know, further guided me with the help of the CRA that's been doing it. Um, because most of the time, the CRA that we went out with was a senior CRA. So they have right. been doing this for, you know, five plus years. Right. Right. Okay. So did you feel like, did you feel prepared after, like for your first visit for your first, so I guess uh, you had to be observed first before you could be signed off to be, to go solo. But did you feel prepared mm -hmm. for that first one after the program? Um, I did feel prepared. My first visit, um, my manager did come out with me and um, I was nervous because it was my very first visit. Right. And um, But I did feel prepared. I knew that um, the program had gave me all of the basics. It's just a matter of you have to actually get out there and do the visit and, you know, get yourself comfortable with everything. Um but I definitely felt prepared. And my manager gave me some good feedback after the visit. And um, so, yeah. So how long how long did it take for you to feel like you really got the hang of it? Um, when I was assigned to my first study, I would say it took me it took me a little minute because I don't feel like like when I get assigned even to a new study now, I don't feel like I really got the hang of it until I'm like, I know all of the assessments that need to be completed, you know, for that visit or I know everything that I need to be looking for. So it takes me even now a minute to get comfortable with a study. Um, but when I was first starting, it took me longer, a longer time to get comfortable with it. But um, I will say maybe a few months. Okay.
Um, now it's not it's not that long. You know, it just depends on the study. Um, but um, yeah, it still takes me. You know, I think no matter what, it still takes you a little bit of time to get used to the new study, just because you're learning a whole new protocol. You're learning, you know, a whole new visit schedule. You're learning new sites. So I think it's going to take anyone some time to get used to. Right. Um, so, yeah. OK, so just wanted to go back for a second. Uh, I know this is not it's not completely off topic, but it's kind of what we were talking about earlier about like how you found out about the industry, mm -hmm. because I know a lot of schools and universities like, first of all, clinical research isn't very like out there in the open. Maybe it's mm -hmm. becoming more so now. Uh, just because of the YouTube presence and some LinkedIn presence, but still, it's not really out there like a lot of other industries are. Um, and you kind of just kind of happened into it, right? Would you say that's accurate? Yes. Um, so what were you originally going to be doing after school uh, uh, if it wasn't for clinical research? Originally, I was looking into public health. Okay. And what made you stop looking into that? Um, really the internship <laughs> okay. because, um, once I got, because once I applied for the internship, it was like a two month process as far as the interviews and everything. So, um, as I was going through the process, I just started researching the industry more okay. and I was becoming like very, very interested in what I was, you know, discovering and everything. So, um, it was really the internship that made me just put a pause on the public health um, part that I was looking for. And I just was like, you know, I'm going to give this a try and see like where it goes. Okay. Perfect. All right. Now back to CRA life. Um, what kind of trials do you like monitoring the best? I know I have my favorites. My favorite is rare disease. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I feel like you've got to feel good about what you're doing. Not, not to say, not saying that like certain other trials aren't good, but I feel really good creating you know, or bringing drugs to market for kids that really don't have many other options or many other treatment options, mm -hmm. um, kids and adults too. But I've typically worked on a lot of uh, peds, case, PED studies. Mm -hmm. um, what what trials do you really like to monitor? Um, so I've monitored. Um, I've monitored for vaccines. I've monitored for kidney disease i've monitored for als i've monitored for um an oncology study but it was um blinded so it wasn't much much done there um as far as the monitoring ex aspect you really just deal with drug when you're blinded okay um i'm sorry i'm blinded um what else yeah, I think that's about it. All of those studies have been like over the span and uh, a few other studies, like a few studies that I've helped like with startup. Um, I helped a few MS studies start up, um, a few osteoporosis studies. Um, but I would say probably my favorite would be... Um, between the kidney and the ALS, just because I learned so much from it. And it was like very, I just thought it was very, very interesting. It was very, um, very sad um, listening to some of the, to some of the patients um, materials because sometimes they have to record. So it was sad for the ALS studies just because if you know ALS patients, you know they can progress um, rather fast mm -hmm. but um, I really like the study because like I said I learned a lot from it okay. um, so that I would say would probably be my favorite okay um, so would you like to do like more ALS studies in the future or would you like to just like kind of do a hodgepodge of different stuff um, I'm actually, um, really interested now. I'm trying to get my manager just to, I've been having my manager look out, um, to see if any like lupus studies pop up because mm -hmm. I'm actually super interested in that right now. Mm -hmm. Um, nothing has popped up so far, but I am hoping that sometime in the future I will be able to get on one. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there's got to be one coming up soon because lupus is pretty common. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay, that'd be cool. Um, so as far as like career progression in clinical research, what what kind of is the career progression? What can someone expect when they get in, you know, entry level? Let's say as a clinical trial assistant, you know, what where does the career often take them? Um, I would say if you start out as a CTA, then your options would be um, move on to B, which most people do, move on to the CRA role. Um, some, I do know some people that went on to like um, the project management side of things. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really know the pro- the career progression for that, but I know that um, some CTAs do move on to the other side and go to project management through a different route and they don't do the CRA route. Right. Um, but as far as the CRA route, it would be CTA, CRA, and then depending on the company you work for and what they call these people, you know, it would be like your project manager and then like the, um, the project lead for all of the countries or the global, or just depends on what company you work for, what they call it. Um, so yeah, that's the general progression that I would say. Um, it's about accurate, or you can do, um, instead of going to project management, you can do line management. Right. Okay. Um, as far as you, what, what kind of interests you about the progression? I mean, I know a lot of people that just like go to CRA and then st- they're like CRAs for like 15, 20 years. Um, I guess as senior CRAs is also, you make a good living doing that. What do you, what about, what about you? What do you think for yourself? Um, Yeah, I know several CRAs that have been doing this for over 10 years. That is not my plan. Okay, okay. (laughs) Um, I do plan to, um, you know, eventually whenever I want to start a family or something, um, this just, I just don't see how women, there are women that do it, but I don't see how they, you know, raise children and have a family and travel as much as we do. So um, I would say, you know, I would be looking to move out of the CRA role once that happens, um, whenever that happens. But um, just in general, for me, um, I am not really sure what route I want to go because I'm kind of on the line of if I want to go into project management at all, just because I just feel like they just have no lives. <laughs> oh, you're exactly right. I mean, I came, I came from that world before I came over to the clinical side. And you're exactly right. They have no lives. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm kind of, um, I've seen like a couple of um, CRA lead positions, which I was like, you know, I think I may be interested in that whenever I stop um, traveling Um interested in the CRA lead and right. then determining what to go to next from there. But I'm not really sure. Um, I'm still trying to figure that part out for myself. <laughs> right. We definitely, you definitely got some time. Um, so you definitely got some time to think about that. And yeah. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's like, I know in, a lot of times in other professions, you, you've got to wait for your boss to leave or something to get a promotion We've got to wait Mm -hmm. for somebody to die to get a promotion pretty much. But it's definitely not like that in clinical research. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree Um, for the most part. I think as far as getting promotions while you're a CRA, it's pretty easy um, to get promotions while you're a CRA to the next level of CRA. I think when it becomes tough is when you try to transition out of the CRA position. When you try to go to those upper roles, um, I think it becomes tougher to get the positions because I spoke with um, a lot of senior CRAs and they just, you know, they're telling me like they're trying to get out of the CRA role, but there's not enough project management positions or there's not enough line management positions or some of them just want to stay as CRAs. Um, But um, a lot of the time they just tell me like it's tough to get a position, um, in project management after CRA. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, Cause it's just a matter of whatever company you work for having that open 
um, you know, project management position for you right. at the time that you're ready to transition. Cause they might have it a year before you're ready to transition or a year after you're ready, you right. know? Right. So it's just a matter of timing. Yep. And there could be like increased competition for it. Cause you know, a lot of these places do have project management training programs mm -hmm. um, in place for like the other people under the project manager, like project mm -hmm. coordinator, project specialist, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the title is, they all have different titles, but, um, they have like a development process for them also. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's interesting. So plenty of uh, space there on the ed, on the end to think about what you want uh, career wise. Um, but yeah, do you do you see yourself being in clinical research for a long time? I do see myself being in clinical research for uh, a long time. I say that I'm still trying to figure out exactly um, what I want to do because now I'm opening myself to um, looking at the business side and um, different things like that. So I'm also like looking into the finance aspect of clinical research mm -hmm. um so i'm just all over the place right now just trying to figure out like what area i want to go into um after i'm done with the cra role okay how about how about contract monitoring would you do that see i've never actually heard of that so i'm not even sure <laughs> you've never heard of a contract monitor no not a contract monitor oh wow okay. i've heard of i've heard of people that um like do the contracts in the beginning for the sites. Um, is that what you are referring to? No, I'm talking about like a monitor. They'll bring on like a contractor. So they'll mm -hmm. pay, they'll pay them hourly. Like oh, for, okay. Yeah. See, I was thinking about, I was thinking about like contract as in money. Contract. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah. No contract monitoring. Yeah. Um, I've heard of, um, I know a lot about it and I know that they get paid very, very well um, when they're brought on as a contractor, but um, just the other side of that is just the benefit side. So if I were to do it, I would just have to weigh, you know, not having the benefits and how much it would cost right. to go and get those benefits. And then you also have to set up your own like LLC and everything like that. And, you know, with the whole tax situation. So it would just be something that I would really have to research and you know, speak to somebody else that's done it. Mm -hmm. But I know a few, um, a few CRAs that I used to work with, they are now contractors. And um, so I have people that I can speak to a, about, but I know most contractors, um, they have like at least five years experience. At least, right? Yeah, it's hard to be a contractor unless you don't have a lot of experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so definitely another, another option there for people. Um, I know a lot of people do like moving into the contract side. Yeah. Just, just because yeah. you do get paid every hour you work. Exactly. Door to door. <laughs> Jeez. I can only imagine what some of those paychecks look like. <laughs> exactly. Especially especially if uh, if your study has you flying all over the place. Right. Right. Oh, man. Especially, imagine going east to west coast, just getting paid to like sit on a plane. Exactly. And I know some... Uh, some CRAs that even did um, went to different countries, oh, so they wow. would go over. They would go over like a couple CRAs that I know that did contracting. Um, they lived in New York, and so they would go over to like London, and he would go over to um, where else did he go? He went to London, and he went to Canada, and um, he went to a few other places. But he could like. Um, Cause he went somewhere else where it was a different language, but he could speak the language. Yeah. So he was fine. There are opportunities out there and you, you, you could say something to this too. There are opportunities out there for monitors that do speak other languages to monitor internationally. Do you know anything mm -hmm. about that? Um, there's definitely, um, opportunities out there. I've, I see them on LinkedIn all the time. Um, I've actually like just looked up some in different countries just to see like, you know, what the, you know, what the job area is looking like in those countries. And they have a lot of just as many, maybe not just as many as the U S but they have a lot of CRA positions open for sure. Uh, but you do have to speak the language in a lot of the times, um, what will trip you up if you're coming from the U S is knowing their, uh, local regulations. 
Right. So if you don't know their local regulations and you can't speak their language, you're not going to get hired. Right. You know, um, now, obviously, it would make it easier if, you know, you speak the language, but you still have to know their local regulations. Because I, I have a few um, ex-coworkers that I know interviewed for positions in other countries, but they didn't get it because they didn't know the local. They didn't know enough about the local regulations. OK. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so there are definitely a lot of opportunities out there for people that want to monitor. That's good. Um, all right, so that's good there. Um, so you're a CRA, you've been there for three years, don't know exactly what you're going to be doing next. What are some of the best things about being a CRA, you would say? Because everyone wants to be a CRA. Uh, I, I mean, I, I have my thoughts about why, but why do you, why do you think people want to be a CRA? Um, I would say maybe the travel, um, you get paid pretty well. Uh, I don't know. What else? I mean, for me, the best things about being a CRA, the flexibility, you get to make your own schedule. Um, somewhat, you know, you have to match it with the site schedule, but for the most part, you make your own schedule if you schedule it ahead of time. Um, there are some instances where you just have to be gone back to back because you may be in like database lock or something like that. But for the most part, like I said, you get to make your own schedule. Um, the traveling can get tiring. It does get like annoying sometimes. But the plus side is you get the points. You get yeah. the hotel points, the airline points, the car rental points. So yeah. if you're a traveler like I am, that helps a lot when you travel for personal um, trips. Um, and then also the benefit of working from home because we do travel so much, we get to work from home when we are, when we are at home. Right. So I think that definitely helps. Um, if you are the type of person that can work from home, like, like you don't get like sidetracked or anything like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I think, I mean, I think everybody gets a little sidetracked at home, right. you know, that's, uh, inevitable, but, some people just can't do it at all. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, the perks, the money, that's why people want to do it. What about, um, where was I going with this? Um, what about when, are there any like downsides to being a CRA? Yeah, the traveling, <laughs> the traveling in the different cities, uh, depending on how your schedule is set up. But I mean, I don't really see a downside um, besides that, because, you know, you can easily tire yourself out from all of the traveling, depending on the project you own. I know when I first got started, I was back and forth to the West Coast. Uh -huh. So um, that was pretty tiring. And I just was doing a lot, you know. So, um, just so, travel wise. So traveling for business is obviously way different than traveling for pleasure, right? Mm -hmm. And and how much are CRAs actually traveling? How much do you actually travel? Um, it's different for every project that I was on. So definitely for the majority of the time, I travel every week. Um, each week is different. Sometimes I have one visit a week. Sometimes I have three visits a week. Okay. So it just depends on the month and the project that I'm on. Currently, um, I'm in the transition of getting a new project and I still have one, um, old project. So currently my travel is light. Um, I just do the project for my old study and my new study. I'm still doing the training. So it's light. But um, generally every week, um, it differs on CRA as well, because some CRAs um, that I've worked with, they like to set their travel up where the first three weeks of the month, they're traveling. The last week, they're home the whole week. So it's dependent on the CRA. And if your company, if your manager is fine with you doing that, because some managers are like, you need to be out every week. Some managers are fine with as long as you meet your required metrics for the month you can set it up however you want if you want to be home the last week of the month so um i would say it's just dependent on the cra okay how do you like to set yours up i'm trying to move to a point where i can do the traveling for three weeks and then home for one week straight but that's traveling every single day right 
for four um, days, four days a week. Yeah, but it also depends on the month um, because some months will have like, you know, two extra days after the fourth week, like a Monday and Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on that. And then it also depends on your metrics. So um, depending on what company you work for, it depends on how many visits you should be doing a month. Um, so I have set it up. I did that last month and I did like it. Um, I didn't have a problem with it. Like I said, because I was transitioning between projects, it was it was fine. Um, I feel like once I get my new project up and running, I'm probably going to go back to just traveling every week. And normally when I travel every week, I'm traveling like I'll leave either on a Monday and come back um, come back like Wednesday or leave on a Tuesday, come back Thursday. Or sometimes I do day trips because I live in Atlanta, so I can do day trips um, for pretty, my... Pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like most of the time I can get, I can get to the site by 9 o'clock, um, you know, getting up early, taking a 6.30 flight. Now, why, um, would, why would you want to do that as opposed to like staying over someplace? Because honestly, when you do it for so long, for me, I just became tired of staying in hotels. I was just like, uh, I don't want to see a hotel. I'm tired of hotels. Um, so I started taking day trips and I just was like gone a lot. And I just was like missing my house. Uh -huh. So I started doing day trips and then my project, you can't do it all the time. But my project was getting to a point where the stuff that I had to review on site it allowed for me to do a day trip because we were getting towards the end of the project. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, so I can do day trips now with my project because it's less visits, less, um, less that they have to collect during the visits. So it's not as much information for me to review. Got it. So the, the day trips work fine. Got it. Got it. But, um, but you know, of course, for like my new study, I know that I'm going to have to stay the night because this is a whole new study. We're starting from the beginning. It's a lot to review. Right. So I know, I know a day trip is not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so I like to, I like to mix them. I'll, I, I mean, I don't have a problem with staying overnight, but, um, you know, I just got to a point where my project allowed me to do day trips and I was just tired of staying in hotels. So I did the day trip. I don't mind getting getting up in the morning, taking that early flight and then um, coming back that same night. I actually preferred it okay. at the time. Now, as of right now, where I am now, now I'm back to doing like overnights. I don't mind doing overnights. But for a period of I want to say about six months, I was doing day trips. Oh, dang. Okay. Yeah, I know I know people get burnt out being CRAs. I know people kind of, you know, eventually just get tired of it. How do you how do you manage that? Well, I didn't start doing the day trips until it was like my third year in okay. that I started doing day trips. So, all before that, I was going and staying the night and doing all that. So, um my day trips didn't start until the third year Got of it. being a CRA. All right. Um but yeah, so, and, and mind you, it's not for every site. Um, it's dependent on the site, but again, at the, at that point in time, when I started doing them, um, and I still do them now for some sites, um, depending on where they're at, um, because the project has slowed down so much and because I didn't have to review, I don't have a lot to, of information to review, you know, like I can go there and be done with work in five hours. Got it. So, you know, that's the type of site that I'm going to because the project has slowed down tremendously. Okay. So that's how I can do a day project because I only have five hours to work of work to do when I get there. Okay. You know? Yeah, that makes so, sense. What was your question? Sorry, I just wanted to like further explain. Because they're probably like, oh, how is she doing a day trip? But no. that, I only have about five hours of work. And depending on the site, that's the higher enrolling site is five hours of work. So my lower enrolling sites, it's even less time than that. Okay. Um, 
so yeah, the question was, how do you manage like the burnout and the stress and you know the travel all the time oh, for the long term? Because I'm sure when you first become a CRA, it's new, exciting, it's fun. You know, mm-hmm. like you said, the first two years, but by year three, um, you know, you're starting to be like, okay, I'm kind of tired of hotels now. So how do you manage that? Um, I would just say for me, when I first started, I was always like, yeah, I'll cover this visit. I'll do this visit. I'll do this visit, which is fine because you're a new CRA. You know, that's like, that's normal. I would say for new CRAs to be like, yeah, I'll do this. Yeah, I'll go here. I'll go there. I'll go. I'll do this. Um, but I feel like once you feel like you're getting to a point where you're just always tired, you feel your body burning out, definitely say something to your manager because your manager should be the one. Um, I say should because it's not always this way, but your manager should be the one to back you up and to tell your project, um, you know, like you can't do this visit or you can't do this because you just, you, you have to stop. Like I said, when I was first, um, started as a CRA, I was going back and forth to the West coast. So, you know, your manager will, in my situation would be like, you know, she can't go back to the West coast anymore. Like, no, she needs to stay regional. She needs to do this. So I would say definitely speak with your manager and then just pay attention to your body because a lot of people will overlook it. And they'll just keep going and keep going and then they'll be burnt out and then they'll just be quitting right. because they're burnt out. Right. So I say pay attention to your body. Don't be afraid to tell your study team no because think about it. The senior CRAs, they have no problem telling people no, that they won't do it. Some CRAs are super and they're like super men and super women and they can just go 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 but everybody's not like that so i definitely say don't be afraid to tell them that you can't do it because um you know just because you need to either either you need to get your mind back together get your body back together or you just need the day to work like you know some people actually need that day at home to work like they don't work well in hotels or you know, different things like that. So I just say, always tell people, like, don't be afraid to tell them that you can't do it. Don't feel like, you know, everything's going to go wrong if you can't do a visit. That's good. That's good advice right there. Excellent. Excellent advice. Um, one more question, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap wrap up here. Mm-hmm. But um, I know CRAs, they typically have a window or studies typically have a visit window in which you can schedule your visit. And then they're always, they always have metrics for like monitoring, like you need to do this many visits a month. Mm-hmm. Well, how, how are you able to do personal travel as a monitor? And I know a lot of monitors that don't really take super long personal trips, but knowing you personally, how are you, how are you able to take, uh, you know, some of these long trips and still manage to get your metrics? Um, well, for the months that I do take long trips, I do not get my metrics. Okay. <laughs> But I am one of those CRAs that says, oh, well, right. <laughs> for that month, like I absolutely aim to get my metrics and get my um, make all of my metrics for the months that I'm, you know, that I have nothing planned. Um, I make my metrics and that's fine. But, um, you know, I have vacation time for a reason. So I use my vacation time. And if I happen to plan a long trip, then I mean, I let my study team know ahead of time, like, you know, hey, I'm going to be out for this, for this amount of time, like in October, I'll be gone for two weeks um, on vacation. But um, like I always do whenever I go on vacation, I took a two week vacation last year. Um, I make sure that I for all of my visits, um, I have completed all my all of my visits within the visit window. Mm-hmm. So I either did it early or it's not due until after I return from my vacation. So I make sure to schedule my visits like that. Um, I make sure that whoever's covering me, whatever CRA is covering me, they will only have to respond to emails. They don't have to go out and do a visit. Um, so they're only listed as a reference in my email if somebody has a question about the protocol if somebody has a question about how to get access to something Mm -hmm. just things that you can handle over email no one needs to physically be at their site um so that's really how i handle it and i let my study teams like i said i let my study teams know 
well in advance. Like for that two month vacation, I let them know three months in advance. Okay. Um, actually, I've let I've let my um, my current study team know six months in advance, so they know that I'm gonna be gone. Um, and like and like I said, I just plan my visits so that I do the visit. I don't have to uh, rely on any other CRA to perform my visit. Um, and so, that's a bit. So you do you do it earlier in the month? So you just do it like that then? Yeah. So like for for my vacation last year, I went in the middle of the month. So I compact all of my visits that I need to do um, into like those first two weeks. And then so that I can make sure I get the report in on time, make sure I do all of that. But I don't, um, if I know that I have something like a two week vacation, I'm not concerned with meeting my metrics for that month mm -hmm. just because I know that that's going to wear me out. Like right. personally, um, that's just going to wear me out. I'm concerned with making sure that all of my sites have made, I have done all of their visits within the visit window and making sure that I just get, you know, as much done as I can on my end so that you know, there's little for the study team to do while I'm gone. Okay. So what happens if you don't meet metrics? I mean, clearly you've been, you've been doing this a while, so nothing like terrible happens. Um, but I know a lot of companies will use that for like a, a bonus, a quarterly bonus or something like that. They'll use those metrics to make sure that you're, you know, you're performing, you know, adequately or above adequately. Mm -hmm. um, so what, so what really happens if you don't meet your metrics? So it's really dependent on your company, your manager. Um, I've been blessed to have pretty good managers. Um, now, granted, last year was the first time that I've taken a two week vacation. Normally it's like a week or less. Um, so that was the first time that I've taken that long of vacation, but my manager was great at that time. She um, didn't have any problems with me taking the vacation. Um, she wanted to make sure, you know, as long as everything, like I said, my visits were done, my reports were done, um, you know, pretty much everything that I just went through. Um, but yeah, she didn't really, there wasn't anything, like I didn't get like reprimanded or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I did lose out on the bonus because that one month is included in one of the quarterly bonuses. So um, obviously I wouldn't get the bonus for that month. But I mean, you know that when you, if you plan a two week vacation, you know you're going to miss that bonus unless, unless you, um, you make it up in some other way. And I could have done it. Um, because I did have extra visits. So sometimes I will put, um, it just depends on how busy my study is. Like for last year, my study wasn't that busy. So I didn't have to do, I didn't have to do the extra visits. But like the year previous to that, I put, um, I think I took a vacation in like June or something. And so I had extra visits in May above my metrics, above the required monthly metrics. And I had extra visits in June, I mean, in July. So it kind of evened out what I did in June or what okay. I did in June. Got it. So um, sometimes your manager will want you to do it like that. Sometimes they won't really say anything to you. Um, more, more often than not, they're probably going to want you to do more in the months before and after your vacation so that even though you didn't meet the metrics for that month, you meet it for that quarter. Okay. All right. So, um, so it's, it's just dependent on manager company that, that you work for. And then your study also, because if you don't have a study that is keeping you busy like that, then you can't, um, you, you know, you can't meet your metrics like right. that. But if you're, if you're on a study that's not keeping you busy, I would think that your manager is trying to find you something else to do anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, so it's just a combination of, of both. And, um, and even for like my current study that I'm on, I think this year, um, last year I didn't have to do it, but this year it's probably going to be me doing more in September and more in November, more visits than the, than the um, monthly number of met, um, for, of visits. All right. Got it. Got it. All right. That was a, that was a, that was a great uh, question there. 
I've got one last question that I've been asking every guest so far. So one last question for you, um, not related to clinical research. This, your answer can be like anything that you just, you'll see. So the question is, what are you obsessed with right now? And it could be anything. It can be like you're obsessed with like, you know, going for walks since it's nice outside now or, you know, whatever it is. Don't give me some political correct crap about like world peace or something like that. What are you truly obsessed with right now? Um, Right now, I would say that I'm just obsessed with traveling. <laughs> well, that's a good. You're a CRA then, right? I, uh, no, I'm obsessed with uh, with personal travel. <laughs> like this year alone, um, I'm just like crazy, like um, just with planning trips. But I'm just trying to get them done. And yeah, so I would say right now I'm obsessed with not work travel, but I'm obsessed with personal travel and visiting different countries and just getting new experiences. Um, yeah. So that would be what I'm obsessed with right now. All right. That's a good one to be obsessed with. Um, <laughs> that's funny. You said you had to put the stipulation in there, personal travel. Yeah. Personal travel, not work travel, work travel. I'm, you know, I'm past that point. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the, the show today. Nope. Uh, Problem. I enjoyed it. Okay. Um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Um, anybody who's still listening right now, you can comment down below any questions you may have for Tiffany and I'll forward them to her. Or you just, if you have any questions down below, you can just leave a comment and I'll respond. Um, as always, email us at eliteclinicalgroup at gmail.com for any inquiries you may have or anything like that. So thanks again, Tiffany, for coming on the program. No problem. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Definitely. <laughs> All right.